performance is a user experience story. We have a number of metrics to try to tabulate performance grades, but some are still more intangible than others. Yet, we are still capable of labeling some as anti-patterns. Such an anti-pattern is a layout shift, or what is known in more endearing terms as jank. Now, in fact, there were earlier attempts to label jank with a layout jank API, but that has matured to more of a sort of layout shift index. But here to talk about how to avoid layout shifts with images is a close companion to the web community, a ardent defender of web standards, and a web technology evangelist at Apple, Jen Simmons. Enjoy. I'm Jen Simmons, and I'm going to talk today about using the width and height attributes in HTML to improve the page loading experience and reduce the layout shift, the shifting of content as the page is loading. Let's start with the bottom line. In your HTML, you want to put width and height attributes on all of your images. In HTML, an attribute is that extra little bit of data that gives the browser important information for a particular HTML element. Source, alt, width, and height are four attributes on this example that tell the browser where the file is. Extra information in case the image isn't loaded or seen by somebody and the size of that image width and height. Well, what kind of difference does it make? Did you see it? That's the difference. Look on the left. Now look on the right. Now let's do it in slow motion with and without using width and height attributes. It improves something very subtle about the user's experience as the page is loading. So the first question people usually have is they're a bit confused because they say, well, how big is the image going to be? I, I don't know. It's the era of responsive web design. Images are going to come out the other end after layout is complete and all sorts of different sizes. What do we, well, it's not the question at hand. Think about this very simply. You just want to provide to the browser information about how many pixels are in the image. How many pixels tall is this image? How many pixels wide is this image? This is metadata about the content. This has nothing to do with layout, has nothing to do with CSS or viewports or retina screens or any of that stuff. It's just literally how many pixels are in this image. Tell the browser. The other question I hear a lot is, well, I don't know how big the image is going to be. I didn't make it. Someone else uploaded an image to the website and there's all sorts of different kinds of sizes and shapes that happen. Well, right. But in those situations, which are incredibly common, there is some sort of mechanism, some sort of build system, some sort of magical robot in the cloud who's changing the shape or size of that image that's compressing it, that's cropping it perhaps, that's resizing it to the correct size. That system is then going to generate code, which has a URL to that image. That is exactly where and who you need to get to put out this information of the width and the height. Literally, robot, you just made the image. How big is that image? Please put that on the page as well as the URL to that file. That's what we need to do. Many of us are already doing it and have been for years, but if you're not, you need to make this change to your system. The other thing to note is that there's no unit on this particular bit of code. It's just 470, for example, not PX. There's no PX. It feels old. It feels a little bit ancient, perhaps. Yeah, it's because it is. This is a little bit old. So I'll explain more about that later, but just bottom line, don't put a unit on it. So what is this? Let's go deeper. What is it that's happening? Well, when the browser goes to paint the page and lay out the page, it has all sorts of different boxes and CSS and layout data and calculations that it's happening. But at some point, it's going to create a containing block for content like this, where the browser knows how wide that box is going to end up in the moment that it's painting that box. And what we want to have happen is for the browser, well, it does. It calculates this paragraph and the amount of space that this paragraph is going to take up. And after this paragraph has, has been, the size of this paragraph has been calculated, how many lines are these words going to need? Then the browser knows where to put the 
next bit of content, the image. And once it knows how tall that image is, then it knows where to put the next bit of content. And once it knows how big that content is, it knows where to put the next bit of content and so on in a flow layout. Each placement of any part of the content is dependent on the content above it and how tall that content is above it. So if the browser doesn't know how big the images are, then it paints the image, the paragraphs as if there's the images are all zero pixels tall or if the images didn't exist or something. And then once the image shows up, once it's downloaded from the network, then the browser realizes, oh, now I know how big it is. And it moves the other content down to make space and keeps moving other content down to make space. That's not what we want. What we want instead is for the browser to know how big of a space that it should have for the image and to reserve that space, even if the image hasn't downloaded yet. And then once the images are available, put them into the spaces that it's reserved for it. Now, this is not the first time we've had this problem. This has been a problem since images were first put on the web way back in the day when modems were very slow and images took forever to download. And this problem was solved in HTML3 with the addition of the width and height attributes by telling the browser how big the image is going to be the browser could reserve that space before the image had downloaded. And so we have this weird history where we had this problem and then we fixed it for a good long time and then it broke again. So why did it break again? Well, it stopped working this original solution because we started resizing our images with CSS. It works still, it worked this whole time if you didn't resize your image with CSS, but with the advent of responsive web design, most websites, most situations, we started resizing the image with CSS. In a fixed width design, the browser knows, okay, I'm gonna take this 600 pixel wide image and this 470 pixel tall image, and I'm gonna, that's exactly, that's literally how big I'm gonna put it, I'm gonna put it on the page at that size. But once we started resizing our images with CSS, the browser was just like, I, I know how wide to make this image, I'm gonna take there, I've got a width of 100%, uh, it, you know, the, the browser is saying width of 600, the, the HTML is saying width of 600 pixels, and then CSS comes along and says, no, how about a width of 100%? And the browser's like, okay, I know how to calculate 100%. And the HTML says height of seven, uh, height of 470, and then it says height of auto, and the browser's like, I, how do I, height of auto? I don't, I don't know what to do, I don't know. So what's changed to fix this again? Well, what we're doing in browsers is making a very subtle and small change to the interaction between the CSS and the HTML attributes and how they interplay with each other. So that at the very beginning, before the image has been downloaded, the browser can go ahead and throw some algebra one math at this and take the height and the width and solve this equation for Y and know how much space to reserve for an image. The good thing about the fact we're using an old solution again, is that there's a lot of great tooling out there. There's even blog posts and all sorts of best practices and content management systems that have been printing the width and height attributes of all of the images this entire time. And we can reuse those tools or keep using those tools or go find them. If we're using new frameworks or new systems that don't have width and height attributes, there's actually a lot of information already out there about what this should be. Now, of course, anytime there's a change to a browser that makes us nervous, makes web developers nervous because we ask, well, you know, what, a, what about the browsers that don't have this support yet? In fact, I think I've made this joke in like every conference talk I've ever given where people sort of have this moment of, but I can't use this because it's not in 100% of the browsers out there yet. Well, actually support for this is pretty great already, even though it first shipped in browsers in December, 2019, it's already widely out there. The other thing is anytime you ever have that nervous feeling about a new web technology, you should ask yourself, well, what happens in those older browsers if I go ahead and put out code to support this new thing in the world? Uh, is there actually a problem? Because often, if not always, almost always in HTML or CSS, there's not a problem. You don't have to worry. HTML and CSS are designed to be evolved over time and to never break older websites. So you can leverage those qualities. And in this case, well, what's the difference between having support or not having support? Well, it's the difference between 
having content move around or not having content move around. So you should do this now. The only thing that will happen is that people who are using browsers that don't have support will simply have the older experience where the content moves around. Why would you not want to help 80% of your users now because those 20% are going to have the older experience? Go ahead and, and do this now, basically. You do want to think about, there is one potential problem though that I want to make sure that you know about and that you make sure you handle, which is you don't want to end up with images that get all weird and squished. We want when our CSS is resizing our images for them to maintain their intrinsic aspect ratio, which means we need to make sure that if you've not had width and height and you're adding them into your system, that you take a look at your CSS and see and make sure that both your width and height are being addressed by CSS. If you're using CSS to resize images, you need to tell it to do both the width and the height. So you might need to go in there and add width uh, height auto, for example, into your code. Why? Well, if you didn't have width and height attributes, you could just be getting away with only putting width of 100%, in which case the browser is just gonna be like, hmm, what should I make for height? I'll do auto height. It automatically does auto height. But if you have the width and height attributes, then the width is gonna override the width attribute, the width in CSS, but there's nothing in your CSS as a developer to tell it what to do. So it's gonna go ahead and use that attribute and it will keep the image at a 400 pixel wide height while making it 100% wide. So it will get wider and narrower and get all squished, which is what we don't want. So solve this by making sure that once you put the attributes in, you have both width and height handled in your CSS. Now I've been saying with 100% and height auto just to keep these examples a bit simpler, but of course, you could have width of 50% and height of auto or min width. You don't, maybe you're not using width at all. You're using min width. The same exact principle applies. And in fact, you could be saying, hey, I want the height to be 100% or 20 viewport height unit, viewport width units or height units or min height 100%. There's just so many different ways that we can write code like this. But basically, no matter what you're doing, if your image is flexible, in either dimension, you're gonna want the other dimension to be auto and you're gonna to need to explicitly write that in your CSS. I also wanna clear up a few misconceptions that I've seen out there about this. It feels like it's so hard to talk about it and understand because it's this little noodly thing about how page loading happens, but somehow some people sort of associate it with the wrong thing. So I just wanna clear some of those up. So one, this always works the same way. This adjustment to calculation and page loading, and it, it doesn't matter how fast or slow the network connection is. I've seen some people say, oh, this just works on slow connections. No, it works this way all the time. The effect is more prominent and it's better. It's more pleasurable for users when they have are on a really slow network connection because you get a better, you, the gain is more noticeable, but it's not like the, the calculations are done differently depending on the network connection. That would be really hard to keep track of. Also, this has nothing to do with lazy loading. Um, lazy loading, the lazy loading attribute that's new to HTML is also really cool. You should go learn about it. But the only thing that these have in common really is the timing, that they're both happening in the winter of 2019, 2020 and into the year 2020. Um, but they're actually completely separate. They do different things. They kind of have nothing to do with each other technically. Also, this is not the CSS property aspect ratio. I've seen a lot of people attribute this to being part of CSS or having something to do with the aspect ratio property. Um, there's a human story about how things came about, but there's not any technical connection between these two things. And in fact, this change is only gonna work for images and because images have an intrinsic aspect ratio and the CSS property is all about explicit aspect ratios and extrinsically defining an aspect ratio, which is a completely different thing. So don't think they're the same, they're not the same. This change is a change to the HTML specification where we basically came in here and said, rather than being like, I don't know how tall to make this image, the browser can use some algebra and solve it and go ahead and calculate the height of the image at the very, very beginning before the image has loaded because it got the information that it needs from the HTML itself. The other thing to know is that this change to browsers has 
absolutely no effect on page layout. There's no tool here to make a cool new different something layout. This is simply about how things work in the moment before an image has loaded. Once the image is loaded, it's identical. Like it's identical. This is, this is nothing to do with changing page layout. Um, and in fact, if it did, it would potentially break the web. We wouldn't want older sites and newer sites and sites with and without this code to like have different, somehow old sites totally changed. Like it, it doesn't affect the final result. The final result is exactly the same as if you, um, if these changes were not made to a browser. So, Lastly, what about responsive images? What about using image source set or the picture element to have a set of images depending on the size of the screen or the density of the screen and whether or not it's 1x, 2x, 3x. There's a lot of really great solutions now that get umbrella under this umbrella term of responsive images to solve these problems so that you can send the smallest amount of data to the user while simultaneously providing enough resolution to have a really beautiful experience. Um, so if you're using source set on an image element, you're going to be fine. Just use the width and height from one of the images, maybe the default that is in the source element, or maybe it kind of doesn't matter which one, but just pick one of them. In this example, I have width of 500 and height of 375. Um, because one of these images, the image underscore 500.jpg is 500 by 375. Um, but you can see in that little math there that really what matters is the aspect ratio. That's 500 by 375 and 1000 by 750 both calculate out to a 4 by 3 aspect ratio. And that's what the browser is doing with this math is solving for that equation for y, and it doesn't really matter which set of numbers is used as long as all of the numbers have the same aspect ratio. Now, of course, the picture element in using source, using a bunch of different source elements, is a way to provide to the browser a range of different images, choices for images. The browser will choose one of these. And these images might be different aspect ratios, very intentionally different aspect ratios, where you want a square on a small screen, you want a big wide image on a bigger screen. So what do we do for that? Well. Right now, we don't have a solution. Right now, the solution is being discussed, and I mean right now, like this week as I record this video in October 2020, um, this is almost finished. Although, you should look this up before you use it and make sure that this is, in fact, what goes into the specification. It's fine for you to ship code based on this before it lands in browsers, but you should wait until the specification is done and when we've agreed in the spec that this is what we're going to do. But it looks like what we're going to do is pretty simple. We're going to put width and height attributes on source elements. So if your sources have different ratios, different aspect ratios, then you can put different width and height on each source. And the browser, as it chooses which source to use, and it grabs the URL from that source, it will also grab the width and height from that source. And that's what it will be using in the page calculations. Um, I think it's going to actually work pretty well. We just need to wait a little tiny bit longer than today for me to make sure that uh, this is what we're going to be doing. So in summary, in your HTML, put width and height attributes on all of your images, get your magical robots to generate this code, make sure you have both width and height defined in your CSS, and you'll benefit. Thanks.